Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, technical director was fired because he was lazy and created the same passwords for all employees. The second story, I refused to drive the faulty car, so I was sent home. The next day I received full payment for the working day. The third story, a snotty lawyer demanded I stop parking in a space that wasn't being used, so I stole the best space available for her clients. And the first story is, don't want to fix my IT issues? Well, I think it's time for a new CTO. I just want to state that this IT issue is going to blow some people's effing minds. The security flaw that this presented was nothing short of incredible. And the fact that we never had a major security breach is astounding. It truly is. Everyone in the entire company's password was the same password. Yes, folks, you read that right. Every single password to every single employee login was the same password. It was like this before I joined the company, and for quite a few years after. Until, well, enjoy the story. Now, what about the username? That must have be the trick, right? Oh, yeah, that was a trick. The username was the employee's email address. I did point out this flaw to my management, and their response was, that's not our area to be concerned about. So, whatever, it paid well, I'll do my job. And then one day we had a Windows update, which caused a piece of the software I used at work to break. I submitted a help ticket, and after escalating this issue, I got to the CTO. It wasn't a huge company. The CTO said, I don't want to spend the time fixing this, use this workaround. To which I pointed out the workaround slows things down, makes my job harder, and this Windows update has to affect more than just me. I was told to suck it up. Now at the time, the CEO was the son of the founder and a bit of an epwit. I legit feel at this point in time he was just collecting a paycheck and letting everything run on auto and didn't pay attention. But I was mad at the CTO for brushing me off, so I penned an email to the CEO. It was a short email. I simply said, I discovered a massive security flaw that could potentially expose us to huge liabilities. When would be a good time to discuss this? The response? What security flaw? I decided to demonstrate the flaw. I picked two random salespeople. I didn't know them. I got their username and I logged into their systems. And I pulled two random customers' personal information. The kind of information that would have easily allowed me to commit identity fraud, pull out credit in their names, etc. All kinds of bad stuff. I emailed the CEO and explained, anyone who knows the URL to log into our system can log into anyone's account, pull up customers' information, and everyone has the same password. To prove this, I logged into two employees' random accounts and pulled two different customers' profiles, and I've attached them. One single disgruntled employee could screw us over. 25 minutes later, my phone rings. It's the CEO. He was nice, very interested in how I did this. This guy isn't the sharpest knife in the drawer and I pointed out the flaw in plain English and the liability that it presents to him. I walked him through the process of hacking my own account as he called it. I'd hate to call it hacking because it was so easy. Now it dawned on the CEO that this liability was huge. I pointed out again in our conversation a single upset employee could destroy us. The fact it hadn't happened already is nothing short of a miracle. I get told they want me to present this to the executive team so they can discuss the solution. Honestly, the solution is effing obvious. So a day later we have the conference call. It's the CEO, the CTO, COO, CFO, the company lawyer, the senior VP, etc. And on the call I demonstrate the flaw, and I lay out how I as a layperson with very little IT background is able to figure this out. It's incredible that we have this flaw. Everyone is in agreement that this is a huge issue, except the CTO. The CTO gets very upset at me. He wants me fired for hacking the system. He says that per our employee handbook what I did is a fireable offense. I point out that I'm not abusing this loophole, and I'm only doing it to expose the flaw because I care about the company, and I think this is something that needs to be brought forward. I point out that a former disgruntled employee could log into an account and steal customers' personal information, and if that were traced back to us, the liability would be huge. I could tell our corporate attorney agreed with me and was shocked at what I was demonstrating. The CTO pointed out that former employees' usernames are disabled, to which I pointed out, every employee username is their email address. It would be trivial for a former disgruntled employee to use a different employee email address that they remember to log in, and since everyone's password is the same, they don't even have to guess. The CTO points out that we would know who did it because of the IP address. I pointed out that VPNs are indeed a thing. The corporate attorney actually wasn't familiar with what VPNs do, and I explained it. And what shocked me is the whole time, the only person in the meeting who didn't agree this flaw needs to be changed was the CTO. 
The CEO made it clear that this issue would be fixed by the end of business, that day, and there was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. After the meeting, the CTO called me, privately. He was peeved. I just exposed his incompetence because the system was his design. The decision for everyone to have the same password was his decision, and I know why he did it. He did it because he was effing lazy. And I said to the CTO, you're an SHCTO, you shouldn't be in the position you are, and you're lazy. You should have found a better solution for my help ticket. He stops and asks, so is this about your stupid help ticket? I go, yes, yes it is. He laughs and says he's going to have me fired, and I laugh and go, I'm pretty sure someone is getting fired, I'm also super confident that's not going to be me. Well, sure enough, later that day we got an email stating that everyone was to change their passwords to something unique. A week later, the CEO announced the old CTO stepped down to spend more time with his family. On the first day of the new CTO's tenure, he sent me an email telling me he wanted to personally work on my help ticket and find a solution around the Windows update, which I'm pleased to say he did. The attorney admitted that was just plain dumb luck on our part, and if we would have had a security breach, it would have been very bad for us. The next day is… Do a pre-trip inspection before heading out? Yes, sir. It was a dark and rainy early spring day. I was working for a trucking company that shall remain nameless, but we did local deliveries and were a union shop. I came in to work for my normal shift. It was a Wednesday, I believe. Hanging on the time clock is a sign, in naturally broken English. All drivers must pre-trip. This is mandatory. All trucks must inspect beginning of shift. Failure to do so result in fines from police. Company will not pay you back. As I make my way from the time clock through the warehouse to the locker room, I learn from my union brothers and sisters that a driver had gotten pulled over that morning for a random inspection by the commercial vehicle inspectors in my fine city. I of course let out a hearty chuckle as soon as I heard this tidbit, because I'm well aware of the jalopies were operating out there. There are kickbacks going from the contract mechanics back to the managers in order to preserve this fragile relationship, and said mechanics also siphon the company fuel from our trucks each time, about once a month. They go to the shop. The trucks are held together with paper clips, JB Weld and some thrift store shoes. I approach my manager, who very sadly for him, is almost always in his office when I start my shift. I've had my fair share of headbutts with this guy for the duration of the 18 months that I've worked there. It just so happens that before this local driving job, I was a long-haul trucker for three years. I've been inspected in multiple states, including Texas, California, Idaho, and Illinois. I ask him if he's aware of the condition of the trucks we're operating, and that only one or two out of the ten would actually pass an inspection from real DOT guys. He asks me what I mean. I mention how I brought up the condition of the trucks to him before, and that basically nothing gets fixed unless the truck is literally being towed back to the shop. He just says just do the pre-trip and report any issues to him. Fine, out I go. I start with the one I use if it's available, 2581. Of course I know that it doesn't pass, the parking brake does not stop the wheels from rolling, and the truck can only be parked on completely level ground. Let's not bring up the absolute tragedy that could happen should someone who's not aware of this parks on an incline somewhere pedestrian heavy. Of course it doesn't stop there, the oil is low, and a turn signal lamp is out. The steering tires are basically bald too. Each item gets a check mark for a major defect and a mark of unsatisfactory from the driver, your correspondent. I bring this back in, place it into the paperwork basket and resume my quest for a safe truck. 19245, this one is far worse. The hydraulics on the lift gate do not keep their pressure, a headlight is out and the engine oil is low. It doesn't have reflective triangles nor a fire extinguisher. We will leave alone the OSHA issue of roll-up doors that easily require 120 pounds of lifting force to open, because that safety issue is not within the scope of DOT inspections. In any case, trucks without emergency equipment are grounded. Inspection report number two goes back into the basket without a word from me. I resume my quest once again. Now 19405 is actually pretty good. Mechanically, it's in all kinds of disrepair. It wheezes and shakes while it moves. But according to the items the inspection report, it is passable. Except for one thing, the windshield wipers do not work. Remember when I said it was raining? So, this inspection trip is short, because all I had to do was turn the key in the test wipers to know it wouldn't pass. I go right back in and see my lead hand standing by the paperwork basket holding two reports in his hands. LH, you just gonna keep failing trucks until you run out? Me, no, I'm going to inspect trucks until I find one that passes, and then use that one. LH, you know all the trucks are going to fail, they're terrible. Just go get one and load up your stuff. Me, I can't do that. As a driver, when I sign these forms, I'm signing that it's safe to drive, and I'm liable if something goes wrong, and now the company is telling me I'm going to pay their fines too. 
Now Boss Man comes out of his office and asks why I don't have my stuff loaded up yet. It's a good 45 minutes into my shift at this point, and the real work hasn't even begun. I tell him the trucks don't pass inspection. Lead Hand, who's always Boss Man's attack dog, starts yelling in my face for me to go pull a truck into the dock. This has attracted an audience at this point, and I tell him I'm not going to do that. Okay, I yelled back. I'm not innocent. We have a history, this attack dog and me. We both work hard and he bleeds company blood and I only bleed green. We're yelling at each other, and it becomes apparent that he wants to physically intimidate me into doing his will. The manager pulls him away, sends him into the locker room, and then proceeds to yell in my face himself. I get sent home, less than an hour into my shift, albeit not a busy day when they couldn't do without me. Of course, in my personal vehicle on the way home, I place a call to our union steward about the situation. Upon arrival at home, I email him the details of the situation, and I go to a movie with my girl. The next day, I'm informed I'll be paid for the full shift of work that day, and that should it be required, the lead hand will fill out the pre-trip inspection form for the truck I need to operate. The last story is... Petty Lawyer Doesn't Leave Well Enough Alone the office building in which I work sits on the very end of a row of separate but joined older buildings in a small midwestern town. Parking has always been problematic, as there are only two dozen spaces shared by about 10 to 15 businesses. While these are public parking spaces, and anyone can park in them, there had always been an effort made to keep them free for customers by having all employees park in the private gravel parking lot behind the buildings. While we were not one of the lot's three owners, for well over two decades, there had been a common understanding that we could park back there because they'd rather we not take up spaces needed by paying customers. My vehicle at the time was small, so I chose to park in the gravel lot at the very end of the mostly unused access alley, right on the corner where no other car could fit. This meant that not only was I not using the customer space, I wasn't taking any space from any of the other employees either. One day while parking in my usual spot, an attorney who rented an office in the same location came out and angrily demanded I move. This attorney and I had a bit of history, as she had been the counsel for the company I had worked for previously, and since she was a lousy attorney, the company had parted on less than amicable terms with her. It was also common knowledge in our town that she was just an unpleasant person to deal with. I refused to move, pointing out that since I was technically parked in the alley and that it was a public right-of-way, she had no legal standing to tell me I couldn't park there. This peeved her off even more, and later that day she faxed a very snotty letter to my office, stating that she was the legal representative and one of the lot's property owners, and demanded we stop parking in the rear. Rather than fight the issue, everyone in my office started parking in the public spaces out front, thus making it that much more difficult for customers to find a convenient place to park. This didn't affect us that much, because we're in a service industry that doesn't rely on walk-in clientele, whereas almost all our neighbors were retail. As for me, since my day began early enough, I was always able to snag the public space directly in front of the lawyer's office. So not only did she have to stare at my car from her office every single weekday, none of her clients would ever be able to park in the most convenient spot. I hope you love these stories. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new video comes out.